Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We've got uh, quite a few people traveling and, and uh, different ones. Some, some are traveling in right here. That's a blessing. But uh, we have some of our families are still out and uh, doing some vacations and things. So you'd be praying for different ones that are traveling there. Pray for the Pankinans. They're having some medical problems with the youngest. So uh, keep them in your prayers if you would. I was uh, excited yesterday. Uh, my wife and I celebrated 28 years of marriage, so it's getting pretty serious. Um, I think it'll probably go forward, so that's good, but uh, it's a blessing. Galatians chapter 5, do you remember how when you were a kid, you were excited about getting older, you were excited about growing, and we were all about wanting to grow uh, when we were a kid. I Never really got there, but I did. I was excited about it while I, while I was a kid. It's a funny thing. Uh, the only time in our lives that we like to get older is when we're little children. In fact, uh, if you're less than 10 years old, you're so excited about getting older and growing up that when they ask you how old you are, you talk in fractions. I'm five and a half. I'm six and a half. Now, when you become a teenager, you skip the fractions altogether and you ask, somebody asks how old you are, I'm going to be 16. You just go ahead and go up to the next number. And then that magical time when you become 21. It's like a ceremony. You become 21. And then you turn 30. Like bad milk. You turn. You turn 30. But there's a time in our life we're excited about growing up. About growing. And then as you get older... <laughs> Growing isn't referring so much to here as it is, well, other places. Amen. And we don't want to grow anymore. But uh, growing is important. Parents mark their kids' uh, growth sometimes on the door jam. And the marks go up as the kids grow up. What about our spiritual growth? That's a vital part, a vitally important part of every one of our lives. I agree with Steve Seibold when he says you're either growing or you're dying. It was six months ago that we unveiled our theme, Grow, for the year 2022 for our church. And I thought that it might be a good idea if we spend a few weeks here. Now we're right smack in the middle of the year. We're going to spend a couple of weeks doing a six-month checkup. okay, And talk about uh, simply, are you growing? Because it was then that I challenged and I tried to do is uh, instill some things in my life and into my habits to encourage growth and uh, encourage you to, uh, every one of us to have the goal for us in our spiritual life to grow. And so my question to you today is, are you growing? We're going to look at some things in the Bible, if you will, marks on the door, Bible indicators that tell us if you're growing or not. Look at, oh, at that over the next couple of weeks. Our theme is to grow. How are you doing in it? Let's read Galatians 5, verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, variance emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. I want to preach today simply on this, are you growing? Father, I pray you'd help us in these next few minutes here to make clear and plain the Word of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage feeds into what many consider a conflict between the Apostle Paul and the Apostle James in the New Testament. 
Now, some people read those two writings and they feel that they contradict each other because Paul, after all, taught that we are saved by grace alone. And James says that when we are saved by grace, there is works involved. Now, consider these verses here. Paul said in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Romans chapter 11, verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Now, I know that's kind of a tongue twister, but the point that Paul is making here, it's one or the other. It's either all works to get to heaven, or it's all grace. It can't be part works and part grace, or it's no more grace, he said. You have to choose one or the other. Imagine, along with me, if it was your birthday, and, and uh, people put presents in your lap, and there's that one uncle that threw a present on your lap there, and you open the present, and... After you open the present and looked at it, he says, by the way, you owe me 25 bucks for that. Now, it's either a gift or it's not a gift. Amen? And that's what Paul's trying to say. It's grace or it's works. It cannot be both. But then when you get into the writing of James, he says in James 2.17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without my works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. When you place the writings of Paul and James side by side, there seems to sometimes be a contradiction. But it's really not a contradiction. I'm going to explain it here. Paul warns against dead works. He does that in Hebrews 6, 1, in Hebrews 9, 14. James warns against dead faith. And, uh, by the way, if you read that verse, I like to read it this way, James 2.17, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead. I like to just, for purposes of explaining it, add the little question, to who? To who is it dead? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead. To who? Well, it's if you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's not dead in you, but it is dead to everyone else. There is no impact that you're going to make for Christ if you don't have works to show for it. So he's simply saying here, he's not, I believe, teaching salvation by works. He is simply saying if you have been saved by the grace of God, your life will reflect it. You will show it. If you're a new creature in Christ, people are going to be able to tell there's something different in you. James insists that we have a belief that behaves like it. Uh, we say what we, we also do what we say. Uh, and he's voicing his distaste for those people that brag about how spiritual they are and what kind of a family they come from and how much, uh, how important they are to God. And then they ignore the needs of others. They don't live what they claim. And so he gives us a natural, a rational conclusion. Yea, a man may say thy, that uh, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. Basically, what he's saying here is all uh, some people do is say they have faith and they have nothing tangible to back it up with. But let me show you my faith is real by the life that I lead. That's the point he's making in those verses. Now, there's a foolish axiom that's been around ever since I was a kid, and probably long before that, where people use the phrase, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. Now, that's a Bible truth, but the reason I say it's a foolish axiom is because people often use that to excuse worldly dress, worldly living, and worldly lifestyles. For years, teenage daughters from Christian families who want to wear skimpy outfits or paint their faces in an inappropriate way, would use this maxim. You shouldn't judge people by looking on the outside. God looks on the heart. Now, while that is a true scriptural statement, I remember dealing with this with a young lady while I was a youth pastor in Michigan, and she was uh, complaining about this, not being able to dress a certain way, because God looks at the heart. It doesn't matter what it's on the outside. God looks at the heart. So I posed this situation to her. You're babysitting. It's late at night, you're at somebody else's house babysitting, and you have only you and the young, uh, the child are there in the home, and you hear a noise at the door. So you go to the door, you look through the peephole, and what you see is a man in a ski mask holding a crowbar. My question is, do you open the door? 
don't judge by what's on the outside. Don't, you can't judge a person by what you see. It's what's in the heart that matters. That's why I say it's not only a foolish maxim in, in the fact that it's foolish in itself, but uh, the fact that it's used wrongly. Now, it is true that man looks on the outside and God looks on the heart. Now, that is a truth that we see that what was first used when Samuel is trying to pick the king of Israel and God uh, and Jesse parades all his young uh, sons in front of him. David wasn't even invited to the party. He's out watching the sheep. And uh, each one, Samuel's like, oh, this is him. He's tall, dark, and handsome like your pastor. And he's going to be the one that's going to be the next king, right? And then uh, God says, hey, at the end when he chose David, he says, man looks on the outward, but I look on the heart. Well, it is a truth, but that uh, we, we need to apply it right. Because that's true, that's why I want to live right. That's why I want to do right. That's why I want to look right. Because you can't see my heart. And so all I have to impact others is what's on the outside. Amen? Because you can't see my heart. I, in other words, I'm not God. I can't look at the heart of another man. And that is why God gives us a gauge. That's why He gives us a, uh, these marks on the door to measure our spiritual growth. He calls it the fruit of the Spirit. And in our text we read, but the fruit of the Spirit is. It's important for us to recognize here that the word fruit is singular. It is not multiple choice. I wish it were. Look at the list. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. I'll take love. I like joy. You can keep your meekness. And you can keep your long suffering. And you know what? I'm going to pass on temperance. And I'll take some peace too. That's what we would like to do, isn't it? But this isn't a multiple choice. This is singular fruit of the Spirit. And uh, then it's also, if you'll notice, it is a plural. Uh, the, the fruit that he lists is plural in what it produces. Nine different fruits uh, the, that Christians can bear. In other words, you should be growing in all of these fruits simultaneously. While it is true that some people are more long-suffering, we understand that. There are some people that are more patient. There are some people that have more love. There are some people that have more joy. We understand that. But in your life, these fruits ought to be growing in your life. That's what we're going to use to measure today. So I would like for you to examine your heart in the next few weeks. We're going to look at the first three fruits today and then uh, probably three each Sunday. So that puts us three Sundays. If Common Core hasn't changed, that three times three is nine, okay? Uh, so we'll look at the nine fruits over the next three weeks and uh, see what we can learn from it. The, the first three fruits of the Spirit are emotional. Love, joy, and peace. We begin... With love. This is the first fruit of the Spirit. Love. Uh, agape. Now there's a common word for love among the Greeks. Uh, it was philanthropia. Ah, I said it like a hundred times in my office just fine. Philanthropia. Philanthropy. Alright, you know that word. That's what we get from it. Philadelphia. We get that word from it as well. Uh, the word means brotherly love. Uh, short, shortened version of it is phileo in the New Testament. It's used often. Uh, it is, this is a uh, word that means natural affection or brotherly love. This is when you meet someone with a similar interest and you get to talking to them and you enjoy the talking back and forth and, and you, it's easy to get along with and you think, man, that is just a great guy. That's phileo. Brotherly love. Or you see a pretty girl across the room and your eyes connect and there's an immediate attraction and you want to go meet with her, uh, that is phileo. It's very shallow, it can be. It is just a friendship. It's an acquaintance. It is a, an attraction. Now, agape goes much deeper. It is commonly used in the New Testament to, uh, to uh, in fact, it's always used in the New Testament when it describes God's matchless love that He has for us. When we talk about the love that is in the fruit of the Spirit, he, it uses the word agape. We're not talking about natural affection. We're not talking about attraction. 
we're talking about God's type of love, agape. That ought to be growing in our lives. Now, the world in which we live knows very little about love. Would you agree with me on that? Uh, very little uh, about love. Let me read you a note that one girl wrote to a young man. Dearest Tom, no words could ever express the misery that I've felt since breaking our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. So please forgive me. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, yours forever. And congratulations on winning the lottery. That's the love America's all about. Somebody wrote, and I wasn't, wasn't going to use this illustration because it's a longer one, but uh, that we give the kind of love we give a cow. Because a cow gives us back milk, and a cow gives us butter, and a cow gives us beef once, and uh, gi gives back to us, amen? And so that's kind of how we love. We love to those that can do for us. But that's not the love that it's talking about here in the fruit of the Spirit. It's talking about Agape. Now, a lot of people are like that. They don't know the first thing about love, but love is the summation and the substance of the Christian life. No uh, greater words have ever been penned than for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. This was not the love of an attraction or a fondness of. It was certainly not because of any excellence in its objects. It was a divine, deliberate choice that showed the nature of God Himself. For we did not deserve the love that He gave when He sent His Son. Agape speaks of a love that is awakened by a sense of value in the object. Oh, I love this. God sees value in us. God sees worth in us. That's why he says in Matthew 10.37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is, wor is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What he's saying is if you value things of this world above your value of me, you're not worthy of me. That doesn't mean you've got to go to mom and dad today and scream, I hate you, or your daughter and son and daughter. That's not what he's talking about. It, we ought to value him more than them. Love. The Word is the center of Jesus' teaching. He summarized all 613 commandments of Moses in one word, love. He said in Matthew 22, 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He said to his disciples in John 13, 34, A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. Then he goes further in Matthew 5, 44. He says, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that hurt you, uh, that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. I find it interesting in the Bible that he tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves, And then he says to love our enemies. I wonder how many times those are the same people, amen, our neighbors and our enemies. But is this impossible? It would seem so, but this is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He gives us the ability to love. Let me remind you how the Lord Jesus as a man lived His life on earth. He did not live His life in the power of His own deity, although He could have because He was no less than God. But He allowed the power of God and the love of God His Father to flow through Him like an electrical current flows through a wire. And as a result, the supernatural love of God flowed through the Lord Jesus Christ all the time. And can I tell you today, friend, that the same love can flow through the believer in the same way through the Holy Spirit. We cannot manufacture it. The flesh can only try to imitate it, and it is a weak imitation. But we can't man manufacture that. How are you going to love your enemies? You're going to love your enemies by the power of the Holy Spirit working through our lives, asking God to help you. It's hard to love an enemy, but uh, it is what's expected. The flesh can show what it calls love, but it is flawed at best. True love is of God, for God is love. So, first question, how's your love? How's your love? Are you growing? Are you growing in your love? Secondly, we look at joy. When you look at Christians today, 
you'll see there's a vast difference between them. You'll find common in most churches that there's one basic ingredient missing. Joy. Not much joy among Christians today. There's a story of a young boy who went to speak, to spend a week with his grandfather on the farm. Walking around, he noticed the chickens. They were scratching and playing, and the lad looked at them and said, Nope, they ain't got it. Next, he saw a colt in the field playing and kicking up his heels, watched him for a minute and says, He ain't got it either. Watching all of the animals on his grandfather's farm, he concluded that none of them had it. Finally, he found in the corner of the barn an old donkey, like Eeyore. Long face, frowning, and he's watching this, this donkey that looks like he's lost his best friend, and he's a long, frowning face, and just standing there. And He gets excited, and he screams for his grandfather to come quick. He says, I found it! I finally found it! What, what have you found, he said. Papa, he said, I have found an animal with the same religion as you have. There's a lot of Christians going through life and they're simply miserable. Long faces are acceptable on horses. They're not acceptable on Christians. We shouldn't have long faces. Joy is something that we all long for. We all want it, but it's such a difficult thing to grab a hold of sometimes. Experiencing joy should be the part of a, every Christian's life. It should be a mainstay for us because joy is a fruit that is produced by the work of God in us through the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that even the most mature Christians and the best Christians experience times where there's a serious lack of joy. Job wished one time he'd never been born. In Job chapter 3, verse 11, Why died I not from the womb? Oh, what a wish! Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? David prayed to be taken to a place where he would not have to deal with reality. He said in Psalm 55, 6, And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for I would then fly away and be at rest. Elijah, after defeating 450 prophets of Baal with fire that he called from heaven through prayer to God, he fled into the desert and asked God to kill him. 1 Kings 19. So, how can we experience joy in the Christian life? I mean, if it's we know it's hard to get, and sometimes we lose it even when we're super Christians like we see in the Bible. But can I tell you this? When the devil sees a church full, filled with joyful Christians, he will waste no time in trying to destroy the joy within that church and to rob the members of that joy, uh, rob it from them. Because he knows that a church full of joyful Christians can set the world on fire for God. And so he constantly will do whatever he can to rob your joy. Suppose you went to a football game and everybody just sat there. All the fans in the stand. No matter what was done on the football field, no matter if there was a touchdown or whatever, they just sat there with sad faces. And suppose... Someone did get excited. And they stood up. And they pumped their fists and they said, Yeah, go Packers! Now, I know nobody would ever say that. I said, suppose, okay? Suppose that one person did say that. And everybody looks at him like he's strange, some kind of weirdo, and just stares him down until he too quietly sits down and says no more. Would you want to go to a football game like that? Listen, you'll have more fun going to a dentist to get a root canal than you would to go to some churches with no joy for the Lord. Can I be honest? Who wants to go to a church where there's no joy? Have you ever been to one? I have, unfortunately. And droopy, long faces. Not, listen, nothing is more thrilling than a church where everyone is smiling and rejoicing in the Lord. It's the nearest thing we have to heaven on earth. Amen. That's what we'll be doing there. So how do we get it? How do we get it? The first thing to realize is that joy is not the same thing as happiness. Happiness depends on what happens. Happiness, all right? Human happiness does. Joy smiles in the face of even the most adverse of circumstances. Uh, happiness is circumstantial. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is here today, gone tomorrow. Joy comes from the inside. 
And that is the key right there. That is how we experience joy. Rather than dwelling on our difficulties, that is robbing our contentment, we dwell on God. Of course bad things will happen. But that is the very thing we can pour our hearts out to God. We can cast our burdens on Him, He says. And then we take those things to Him and remember who He is. Peter talks about this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love in whom though now you see Him, not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Did you hear that? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. You see, what you see can bring you misery. So focus on Him that you have not seen. That's what Peter's saying there. He's at whom having not seen. Now this verse talks both about the quality of joy and the quantity of joy. If we bear fruit and we have joy in our life, then we have the possibility of not only joy, I thought I'd visualize this for you, it says we can have joy. Amen? We all need some joy. But that verse says goes beyond the fact of having joy. He says you can have full joy. Isn't that better? Isn't full joy better than some joy? It says full joy. Unspeakable joy. This is the quality, and then the quantity is full of joy. So, Let me ask you today, which one are you? Where does your joy come to? Now you might say, well preacher, you you don't understand. My bottle is completely empty. I have no joy at all. No, 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 that's not quite true because you see, if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, if you accept Christ into your heart as a Savior, your bottle is never quite empty. The Bible says in in Luke 10.20, Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. If you're saved, friend, there's never a time in your life when your name is not written down in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. Praise the Lord. No one can take that away. John chapter 16, verse 22, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh away from you. You see, my friend, no one can take away your joy anyway. You have to willingly give it up. You ever read any about Corey Ten Boom? Nazi prison camp. Slept every night in beds infested with lice. Friends dying all around her, facing starvation. She had joy throughout the whole thing because no one can take your joy from you. You give it away. You, you can mistreat me, but you can't take my joy. You can do me wrong, but I have to willingly give it up if I'm going to lose it. You see, you can't take my joy because you didn't give it to me in the first place. If your joy comes from where it's supposed to come from, nobody can affect it because it comes from the Lord. A lot of problems with joyless Christians is they're getting their joy from the wrong place. And if we get our joy from the wrong place, then it's only there as long as it's dependent on that place we get them from. Okay? If you put your joy in a relationship, then your joy is only as stable as is that relationship. Unless that relationship is this way, and then it can be stable forever. Now, that's why many Christians walk around looking like they've been sucking pickle juice through a PVC pipe. They look miserable. Their, their, their chins are dragging. They look like they lo- their mother-in-law has just moved in the house. They look sad. They look angry all the time. The reason is because they're getting their joy from earthly things. They're getting their joy from temporal things. And we've got to get our joy from the Lord Himself. Our joy in life does not come from what we have. See, friend, our joy comes from who we know. That It has to. It absolutely has to. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 1611, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Joy is the rainbow smiling and triumphant in the storm. Joy is the fountain, fountain bursting from the depths of the earth, reaching for the sky. Joy is the sunbeam that lights the prisoner's cell. Joy is the happiness of heaven imported by the Spirit of God into the receptive human heart. Joy is something that comes from God Himself through the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit. Do you have it? How are you doing in this department? Are you growing? How full is your bottle of joy in your life? Are you growing in joy? Finally, we see peace. The question was once asked a survey, if you could choose what you want most in life, what would you ask for? 
the common answer, most common answer was peace. People want peace. People want peace in their marriages. They want peace in their workplaces. And people want peace in their country. America has the best medical treatment centers, the highest standard of living, the most opportunities afforded, the best educational centers. And with all these things, most people are without true inner peace. The results are devastating. Broken families, hatred, financial anxiety, a country unsettled. Now the world offers you peace through escapism. Drugs, alcohol, immorality, uh, constant entertainment. It is sought through all forms of pleasure, self-satisfaction and positive thinking. And yet the world has never held the answer to true peace. Many believers and people, I guess you could add believers into this group, but many people think that peace is the absence of trouble. That's 100% false. It is not. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of Him in our trouble. That brings peace. Talk to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they're in the fire. And uh, they had peace in the fire. They had peace because the fourth walking among them was as unto the Son of God. So, there is peace for the Christian in every storm. An untroubled spirit that, that can be yours come what may. And <clears throat> Jesus demonstrated this. He was never hurry, in a hurry. He was never upset. Uh, he was never disturbed. And we'll look at Simon Peter. Uh, he learned the secret of the peace, uh, of this type of peace, the day that he walked on the waves. In Matthew chapter 14, it talks about that. The fierce winds whipped the waves into mountains around the boat that they were in. Jesus, of course, had, was not with them at this time. And so here are the disciples out in the night and the darkness has fallen and the waves are tall and they think that they're going to... Uh, it really threatened their very life. And then after it got dark in verse 25, the Bible says in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went under them walking on the sea. That did it. They had to deal with the storm, had to deal with the wind, had to deal with the darkness, and now they have to deal with a ghost as they look out over the water there. This is a great picture of our troubles because what threatens to bury you, what seems to overwhelm you in your life, and what seems to be the very thing that's going to undo you is under His feet, and He can just walk all over it, and it doesn't disturb Him, and He just uh, can be as calm and peaceful right in the middle of our troubles. I love to see that picture. By the way, why did he walk on the water? You'll wonder that. I mean, he could have just showed up. He did later in the upper room. Why did he walk on the water? Was Jesus showing off? Look at me! See what I can do! As the waves go, woo! See that big wave going there. And uh, was he just trying to show them what he can do? I don't think so. Uh, may I suggest that he came to them on what they feared the most. They feared the storm. It was going to kill them, they thought. And yet Jesus came to them on what they feared the most. Oh, how we fear pain and sorrow and death and disease. It brings us turmoil. Yet how often is His pathway to us right over the top of our turmoil? And our pain is often His footpath. That's good stuff. Came to Him right on the water. At the Lord's bidding, as the story goes on, Peter himself dared to step out on the water. So now Peter gets out on the boat, uh, out of the boat into the water. And now Peter's standing on the... Can you imagine? Not only standing on water, but a tumultuous sea. You're moving around, trying to balance yourself on this water. And then a wave slaps him in the face. His eyes leave Jesus. They go on to his problem and he immediately begins to sink. Happens to every single one of us because as soon as your eyes leave Christ and go on to your problem, that's when you're going to have trouble. So that's what he did. He was distracted. And just as quickly he starts to sink, Jesus reached down and saved him back on board. Uh, with Jesus by his side, then Peter had peace again. Peace is having Christ in your vessel, leaving the storms to him. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. 
Turn, if you would, I want to show you something else. Peace through fear. That's an interesting subject. Mark chapter 4, if you would. Go to Mark chapter 4. I want to read a few verses over there. I want to show you the way to peace through fear. Mark chapter 4. In Mark 4, we see another storm. They were again in a different storm. Read verse number 37. Uh, I'm going to start at verse number 37, I should say. Read along with me there. And there was a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and they say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said unto one another, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey them? All right, I want to show you a couple of things out of this passage here. They were afraid. They were in a terrible storm here. They were tremendously afraid. We would be too in a storm like that. We don't like storms. I mean, I don't know about you, but we like when storms show up. I'm talking about things in our life that we can't control. But I want you to notice something, that in this passage, they feared two different times, and they feared two different things. And the two words for fear are two different words in the original language. It gives us some, some instruction here. Jesus said in verse 40, Why are ye so fearful? Dilos. This means timid, faint-hearted, fearful. What's he referring to? The storm. Why are you so afraid? Well, they, it was Jesus. I don't know. I mean, I know you were sleeping, but there's a storm going on. There's a, there, this is threatening our life. That's why we were afraid. It's a terrible, terrible storm. It's a situation that we're in. And this is natural. It is expected. We fear our storm because we fear the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. That's the first fear in this text. Why are you so fearful? Look at verse number 41. And they feared exceedingly. Wait a second. Now the storm's over. All right, now they have peace, but they still feared. This word is a different word for beo. It means to be struck with amazement. Now, can I tell you, friends, the path to peace is through having the second fear instead of the first fear. Being afraid and terrified of your circumstances will give you no peace. But being in awe of and respectful and in fear of the one who controls your circumstances, will give you all the peace in the world. So the path to peace then is fearing the right thing. Uh, Do you fear the unknowns in your life? That's natural. But fearing God instead, that's supernatural. That's why it says the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of the Yoder. You understand? It's not natural to fear God above our circumstances. It's supernatural. Fruit of the Spirit. Are you growing? Are you growing in your peace? One of the best examples of God's peace is found in Acts chapter 12. We're not going to turn there for sake of time, but we find Peter, he's arrested, and uh, Herod's already killed his good friend James, beheaded him, and now Peter is scheduled for execution, and his execution date is tomorrow when he gets up. He's going to be executed. And uh, 16 soldiers are surrounding him, guaranteeing that he wouldn't be rescued. Tomorrow he's going to die. And I'd like for you to, and you probably know the story, but I'd like for you to remember, what was Peter doing? Was he pacing his cell, tearing at his chains, breaking out in a cold sweat of fear? No. Is he biting his fingernails, walking back and forth, trying to build his courage to die like a man? No. Is he praying that this time I would not fail God? Let me be strong and this time I'll stand for you, Lord. Not like I did that one time where I failed you three times. He's not doing that either. The man is sound asleep. Sound asleep like a baby. Actually, no. No, 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 not like a baby. Why do people say slept like a baby? You ever had a baby? They don't sleep. I don't understand why people use that slept like a baby. He slept like a teenager. Let me demonstrate. We're not there, but I want to tell you what happened 
in Acts because the, the angel came in, the doors opened, the soldiers are all out to lunch, they're sleeping, they're, they're out, uh, he knocked them out cold, and so the angel comes up to Peter and says, Peter, 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 Peter. That's what he did. Read your Bible. It says he smote him in the side. That's how you wake up your teenagers, isn't it? You can't just call them, you've got to kick them. Peter is sleeping. I can't believe this. How could this happen with what's happening tomorrow? He's about to face execution and he is sleeping like a teenager. I think maybe he sat there the evening before and maybe he remembered a couple of storms. I couldn't figure out how I was going to get out of that either. But he had them all under control. And I think rather than fear the uh, Herod and his decree, maybe I'll just fear the one that could control those storms in my life and trust that he's got it all in hand. And he's able to drop off to sleep. Move over, Mr. Soldier. I need a room to lay down and get my beauty rest. And he did. And he went sound asleep. Amazing story. There is no peace like the peace of trusting your Lord and Savior. The most important area of your life to have peace with God in is your salvation, friend. The lost man is at war with God every day of his life, but when the Lord saves us, we have peace with God. Uh, believers will often tell you after they have gotten saved how they began to experience the peace of God. It doesn't mean that they're perfect. It doesn't mean they don't mess up. It doesn't mean they don't have to ask forgiveness again, but to have that peace of knowing your eternity is settled. God wants every lost person to have this peace. That's why He says in Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be uh, as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I hope you have this peace, friend. If you're here today and you don't have the peace that comes from knowing where you're going to spend eternity in, in, uh, for, for eternity in heaven, if you don't know that, settle that today. Dear Christian, how's your peace? A Christian attorney named Horatio Gates Spafford lived in Chicago a little over 100 years ago. He was in the Chicago fire of 1871 where over 100,000 people were left homeless. Over 300 died. Spafford, for two years following the fire, unselfishly helped to assist the needs of the homeless and impoverished. He was known throughout Chicago as a sincere, devout Christian. Now, after two years of all this work, in November of 1873, the Spafford family decided that they would go on vacation. He planned to take his wife and his four daughters over to Europe, and they were to spend some time touring and visiting different areas. And uh, so, But as they were preparing to leave, Horatio was unexpectedly detained by urgent business. They decided that since the tickets were already purchased, that Anna, his wife, and his four daughters, uh, Annie, Maggie, uh, Bessie, and Tanetta, they would go on as scheduled. Once Spafford finished his business, he'd get on the next ship and he'd join them on the other side. The ship, the SS Villa de Harva, that carried his wife and daughters, never reached England. Off the coast of Newfoundland, the ship collided with an English sailing vessel. The ship sank about 20 minutes after it was struck. Mrs. Spafford was one of only 47 people that survived. Tragically, all four daughters perished. Anna Spafford sent a heartbreaking telegram to her husband that read, simply saved alone. So Horatio immediately set sail for England to join his grief-stricken wife. And as the ship passed the location where his daughters had went down and drowned in the water, he walks out to the edge of the deck and there he penned the words of this famous hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I hope you never have to face the tragedies that Mr. Spafford had to face. But you can rest assured of this, my friend, some tragedy will find its way into your life. But no matter 
the storm that comes into your life, God gives us a peace that is not dependent on outward circumstances. It comes from the, the inside. And He lets us have that through the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in our life. We can have peace in the midst of the storms of life. Let me ask you, friend, how is your peace? Are you growing? Are you growing? How's your love? Are you growing in your love? How's your joy? How full is your bottle? Are you growing? That's the first three fruits. That's the marks on the door that we can use to judge ourselves and see how we're doing. How are you doing? Since January 4th, when we brought this message and gave the challenge to grow spiritually, how are you doing in those three areas? Are you growing? Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. We talked about three specific things today. Love, joy, and peace. Maybe there's one, maybe there's two, maybe there's all three. You say, preacher, I need help with all of those. I'm not going to ask any questions today other than just invite you to come today to an altar and pray and ask God to help you in whatever area He's touched your heart. If you're here today and you've never been saved, you don't know, you don't have the peace of God that passes all understanding. You don't have that assurance of your eternity in heaven. Well, you come too and let somebody take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. As she begins to play, would you please raise uh, or stand along?